Three, two, one, roll the footage. Welcome back, everybody, to the Strategy Sprints podcast. I'm your host, Simon Severino. And today, my guest was called The Real Deal by Forbes. He's the best selling author of The Introverts Edge, Amazon's eighth most sold book of the week and book authority number two best introvert book of all time. His soon to be released second book, The Introverts Edge to Networking, has already received endorsements from Harvard, Princeton, Neil Patel, Michael Gerber. Dr. Ivan Meisner and Marshall Goldsmith. Welcome, everybody. Matthew Pollard. Mate, I'm ecstatic to be here. Thanks so much for having me on. So cool to have you here. And you have been endorsed by so many people who were here on the show before you. So we are in good company. And you are here to bring a ton of sales and networking expertise for introverts. So not just for everybody especially for the introverts. Absolutely. Let's start with your first book. Why did you do that in the first place and why was it so well received? You know, it's interesting. I mean, we'll get into this a little bit later on, but I was, I mean, I should never have been in sales. I mean, I should have been in a little quiet data entry job where I had a look on my face saying, don't speak to me. You know, I'm here to just do my work. Uh, it was really happenstance that I fell into sales, but my backstory is literally taught myself how to sell watching YouTube videos after losing my job just before Christmas. And literally in Australia, you can't get another job at Christmas because everyone's taking a month long break because it's summer and Christmas at the same time. So I, I taught myself how to sell watching YouTube videos. And then, you know, fast forward just shy of a decade, I, 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 been promoted, I started my own business, and I've been responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories. When I moved to the US, I made the decision that I was going to start sharing with other people the secrets to my success, what I call the three steps to rapid growth. And I talk about the importance of differentiation, niche marketing, and then sales systemization. You know, the three things outside the functional skill of the average service provider that stops them from obtaining growth and having a business that really allows them to make the money that they deserve. But what was interesting is I started to share my own personal story around introversion and succeeding in sales at, just before I talked about sales systemization, just really to bring myself down a peg. I'd put a photo of me with bad acne at my sister's wedding, talk about my reading speed issues and show you know, the photo for those video listeners you know, with my, my funny colored glasses to show that you know I was kind of a little bit unsure of myself. And then I would go into sales systemization. I had so many people afterwards say, Matt, I just had no idea as an introvert that I could sell. And I saw, so I, I mean, I didn't want to write the book. So I kept telling other influencers in the sales space that somebody should write a book on introverted selling, i.e. somebody other than me. Because with my reading issues, there was no way I wanted to write that. Everyone responded, no one's going to buy a book on introverted sales, mate. Like no one, I mean, introverts don't even go to the sales aisle. So I went, okay, I, I keep talking about this. And anyway, I ended up working with a ghostwriter as a client that I took from making literally 27,000 in 2013 and 12,000 in October when he reached out to me in 2014 to literally with, within two weeks, he'd made 40,000, six weeks, 80,000, 120 by the end of the year and just shy of 300,000 the following year. And he's like, Matt, you've got to put these strategies into a book. And I felt with him, I could do it as a collaboration. I mean, he was a working case, uh, like case study, so he was a big supporter of my work. So we agreed to work together on the book. And I mean, it came out in 2018. It sold over 40,000 copies so far. It's been translated in more than 10 languages. And I mean, it's just it's just been a, a runaway success. You know, HubSpot listed as one of the most highly rated sales books of all time. Uh, book Authority listed it as the number two introvert book of all time. And I think, I mean, there are two major reasons for its success. I think the first one is that, I mean, let's face it, sales is kind of confrontational for the average introvert. So the book reads like a novel. They're true stories of real people that are a lot worse off, some with chronic stutters and how they succeeded in sales. So you laugh out loud with these characters and you get to enjoy their stories while learning sales. But then secondly, I mean, there's just no competition. There's not a single other book on introverted selling out in the market place. Now, while I keep telling people that people like Jeb Blunt, people like Zig Ziglar, the most well-known sales trainer in the world, are introverted, those people don't really speak up about being introverted. It's actually funny, Jeb Blunt wrote the foreword for this book, my new one, and he spoke about the fact that I, while most of the people, and funnily enough, most of the people in the upper echelons of sales training and sales leadership happen to be introverted, I was the first one to speak up about it. And I think that that willingness to be honest about my, what most people would call deficits, I call an advantage, 
and my personality type and really confronting that stigma really paid its way in, in leaps and bounds for people to see my authenticity and believe success was possible for them. I have so many questions. So the first one is how do we see that somebody is an introvert versus an extrovert? Because you, you are on stage right now. So what is exactly the definition? And the second one is how did you get endorsed by such huge people? But one after the other. First, what's the introvert definition? So I think people overcomplicate it dramatically. And I, I think, you know, therapists, uh, researchers, they get paid all this grant money to go and further research things that makes it even more complicated and hard to understand. For the average person, if you've got 10 years, go and do all the research. For the simple terms, though, it really is just where you draw your energy from. I try and keep it as simple as possible. I mean, people talk about quiet people, shy people, or highly sensitive people. Again, it can be overwhelming. Let's make it incredibly simple. If you do an interview like this, one-to-one, -one, you may still enjoy yourself. I mean, for me, you know, I still enjoy interviews like this. I still, I love speaking from stage now. I love going to networking events. I love selling. And so many of my, of my introverted clients do as well. But like a kid at Disneyland, you're still tired afterwards where an extrovert is charged up after activities like that. So if you want to break it down to its absolute simple terms, it really is if you draw your energy from being with people, then you're an extrovert. If you draw your energy from being by yourself, you're an introvert. Now, that does not mean if you're an introvert, you're a second class citizen. It just means that your path to success is different to that of your extroverted counterparts. And in truth, you actually have a lot of natural advantages. As I said, Zig Ziglar, the most well-known sales trainer in the world, he was an introvert. So if you think you can't sell because you're an introvert, you're totally wrong. Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI, the world's largest networking group in the world, over 10,000 membership groups, he has a blog post called, Oh My God, I'm an Introvert. And he talked about how he created BNI to create systems and process around the variable process of networking. The founder of Ugg Boots, the billion dollar sheepskin boot company, he was an introvert. Oprah Winfrey was an introvert. So if you think you can't do small talk, how is it someone like Oprah Winfrey can be one of the most well known talk show hosts on the planet? There is no excuse. The fact is that after all of those activities, I'm sure they were tired and that's okay. You have to learn that it takes your energy and you need to build opportunities to recharge into your day or into your week. It doesn't mean you can't do it. So just keep it simple. It doesn't mean that you can't succeed, but as an introvert, you need to know that your energy is drawn from those activities. Cool. So, all right, I'm an introvert and I guess, 80% of the population worldwide are introverts. <laughs> well, you know, close, well, cl they, they say statistically close to 50%. And I would say that that's because people overcomplicate things. I mean, in truth, if you go to a place like Finland or Poland or Lithuania, those countries are incredibly introverted. You come to a place like the United States, and yes, it's a lot less introverted. But is it really, or is it the fact that people are less willing to admit it? Because ever since, you know, People like Dale Carnegie talked about, you know, you've got to be that big, outgoing, get gregarious personality type. And Harvard is like, oh, yeah, you're never going to succeed in business unless you, you, you can have that outgoing personality type. Maybe we don't, we're not willing to admit it. I mean, people like Jeb Blunt, you know, won't, wouldn't admit to being an introvert for the longest time. Now, thanks to my work, he's willing to do so. So I think that in other countries, while people thought that maybe they had some disadvantages, which was perhaps true many years ago when, you know, we were all, you know, having door to door salespeople going from town to town. But in this new connected world, it's actually becoming more like the old days where you're always selling to someone in your community. Because the fact is today I could sell to somebody in China. And if I deliver a bad experience, if I'm if I'm not really authentic in what I do, they could write a review all over the world where people can find it. So I think these days introversion is a blessing. And, you know, even if something's like sales or networking, if you look, I mean, Ivan did a, a, a study uh, about the, the most hated kind of characteristics of networkers and it was self-promotional, right? Those, those kind of self-promotional people they don't like. They like people that listen, that empathize. Well, those are introverted strengths. If you look at selling, I mean, extroverts, while they're good at striking up that conversation, you might say they don't listen so well and they don't really empathize so well. Again, introverted strengths. So introverts, when they realize how to sidestep their skills gaps, and I don't call it deficits because they are just skills gaps, a lot of times they can run circles around their extroverted counterparts. 
On that, by the way, this isn't extrovert bashing by any way, shape, or form. Extroverts can also go and learn to empathize. They can go and learn to actively listen. And the horrible thing about this is that HR, if they notice an extrovert in their organization not listening while not empathizing, they'll send them to training. The problem is for an introvert, they see them struggling to sell, or struggling to lead or struggling to network. And they go, poor little Matthew, you know, Matthew hasn't got enough confidence. He's just an introvert. But they don't send us to training because they believe that it's a gift of gab barrier. And that's why I believe they need more support. Absolutely. You can pick one person and give them the strategy award. Who will be this person? The strategy award? Yeah. Well that is zigs this person is zagging but from your perspective they're doing the right thing yeah so i well i mean ivan meisner is a great example um you know ivan meisner created a group of uh well he created a group for people to follow a networking process you know i, I mean you, you you mentioned you know there's a lot of high level people that have endorsed my book ivan is one of them and what he talked about is how I bought the strategy around networking that he used in an environment which was built on process and showed people how to attach it to every networking event where people seem to be just flying by the seat of their pants, running you know, around to people, will you buy from me? No, what about you? What about you? What about you? Which no introvert wants to do, of course. So, But Ivan, I think if you think about a, a strategic award, I would absolutely give it to him because what he did is he said, the world of networking doesn't work for me. I'm going to create my own version of networking and then I'm going to share it through the world. So, you know, I, I would absolutely give him that award. I've just, and I, you know, I would, I would say I'm grateful because without people like Ivan creating systems and processes around networking, maybe it wouldn't have occurred to me to create a system that can be applied to greater networking, to greater sales. He definitely created the first wave of systematized networking that helped so many thousands of people worldwide. Absolutely. And he was on this show. So people, if you want to know more about Dr. Ivan Meissner, go Dr. Ivan Meissner's Strategy Sprints podcast, and there is a full interview with him that we did. He's really amazing. And now I am curious, what would you suggest that introverts do differently? Well, introverts, the biggest thing that they need to do differently is stop believing that they're second class citizens. They have to embrace the fact that they can uh, they can sell, they can network, they can lead, they can public speak as introverts. I mean, the one thing that I find, and even I'm guilty of it sometimes, I see this amazing person on stage or in an interview and go, oh my gosh, I wish I was like that person. I wish I had that natural charismatic personality. You know how often that I do that and then I meet the person afterwards and we get talking and they're, oh, I'm an introvert as well. So we've got to stop projecting extroversion on anyone that we, that we see as successful. The second thing that we need to do is we need to understand the system. So one of the things I tell people all the time, and I'm not entirely sure my publisher likes me saying this, but I keep telling people they don't need to buy my books. I mean, you can get access to this book, the first chapter at theintrovertsedge.com, which is my book on sales. And you can get access to my book on networking, the first chapter at theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking. And what I keep telling people is the first chapter will get people over the feeling that they can't sell or can't network as an introvert. And then I outline the seven step process. I mean, just the, the sales process alone, I say to people, if you just grab the seven steps and look at what you currently say and fit it into it, you'll realize certain things don't fit. Throw that out. You shouldn't be saying it to customers. Then you'll realize there's some things out of order, and then you'll realize there's some gaping holes, generally around asking great questions and telling great stories. If you fill those gaps and put it in order, you'll double your sales in the next 60 days easily. So just getting the first chapter at theintrovertsedge.com is enough. Now, the second book really helps you understand that the reason why you don't like networking is because you're, you see the way other people do it. And it doesn't work well. It just works better than the horrible way you're networking. Because if you don't like that transactional, do you want to buy from me? Do you want to buy from me? What's your other option? That aimless networker that just has those shallow conversations with people. People ask what you do and you kind of even put it down or you deliver it in an underwhelming way because you don't want to come across as salesy. But that just leaves you walking away with all these business cards that you're never going to call and they're never going to call you. And it's not like they're fostering friendships. You can't even find enough time to meet with the friends you have. So A-list networking doesn't work. So first chapter will help you realize that networking does work. You're just doing it wrong. But there is a way to change the balance in networking. Because let's face it, if you go up to somebody just random, you're likely going to work up to somebody that's selling insurance. And that conversation, I mean, you're, your eyes are going to scream the, the moment you hear it, you're going to want to run away. But secondly, when they ask you what you do, 
If you say something like, oh, I'm a business coach, you'll hear something like, oh, I had a coach once. It didn't really work out for me. That's horrible. Now you've got to say what? I'm different. I've got magic ruby slippers. That's a horrible way to network. Or you might say, oh, I'm a business coach. And they'll say, oh, I've been looking for a coach. How much do you cost? What? Now we're talking about price. We've just met, right? So what do you do in a different way? And what I talk about is having what's called a unified message, which changes the balance, which I can explain for you. And then talk about your unique passion and mission and then sharing great stories. Now, this works incredibly well if the overall strategy is right, i.e. you ask questions, you be interested before you're interesting, and then you build that social capital with the person that you're speaking to, and then not only are they going to be interested in what you offer because, or what, you're, what you do because you showed so much value to them, but secondly, because what you do should be intriguing, not put yourself in a functional skill commodity box where people go, oh, I know what that is, I don't need it. Oh, I know, I'm looking for that, how much does it cost? That is the worst way to network. I want to know more about this. I want to know how you got endorsed by Marshall Goldsmith, by Michael Gerber, by Neil Patel, after one word from our sponsors. Hey, if you love what you are hearing, you will love our free masterclasses. Go grab them at strategiesprints.com. I am right now writing my first book and I am, I am asked by a publisher who will endorse your book and uh, I have to come up with a strategy. You are a pro. How does one come up with a strategy? You know, it's actually not that hard to get high level endorsements. I mean, firstly, if you reach out to someone and say, hey, I have a book, I'd love you to endorse it. They're going to say no. If you reach out to them and say, hey, I'm on this mission to fix this problem in the world. And because of that, I'm writing this, this book to help confront A or to help provide B, then all of a sudden you're going to be a lot more intriguing to them. But I mean, these days in this digital economy, I and mean, one of the things I tell people all the time, I mean, you know, I tell people with this with networking, if you can't articulate the value of what you offer in three minutes when somebody's politely listening, you have no chance when you've got microseconds online. But in truth, today, you can use technology, psychology, and strategy to get your ideal people to, to chase you. Now, I can, I can explain, you know, with Ivan Meisner, you know, that was a, a really interesting, you know, relationship, but it started through one of my momentum partners. Now, in the book, I talk about uh, what I call the three types of people in your, in, when you go networking. And everyone's so fixated on that transactional person, you know, that prospect. How can I find someone that I can sell my product to or to get that new client or, you know, to, to get that new job? The problem is that leaves you stuck in this hamster wheel of constantly trying to find interested prospects, set yourself apart and make the sale. And it's not the real key to your success. So there was a guy, um, Joel Burgess, who is, you know, I, I call him a momentum partner. Now, a momentum partner is somebody that believes passionately about your work and you believe passionately about theirs and you share introductions with each other to podcasts, to high level influencers that support and build your work. Not because you have an official agreement, but because you just generally care about helping each other. You know, Judy Robinette, one of the most connected people on the planet is one of those for me. She's always introducing me to podcasts, always introducing me to high level influencers. I mean, I can track back hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of income and, you know, subscribers, thousands of subscribers to her direct involvement in the introductions that she gave me. But Joel was the one that introduced me to Ivan. Now, again, if you know how to articulate your passion and mission in the right way, then usually your momentum partners can articulate that clearly as well to people. He introduced me to Ivan and Ivan and I fostered a great friendship. Now, it was because I fostered a what I call a champion relationship. Champions are the other group of people that you love to meet in a networking room. These are the people that give credibility to your work, the ones that can share who you are out to their network that, again, provides a high level endorsement and send thousands of customers your way. So when I got that introduction from Joel, I started talking about the value that I could give him. For instance, I interviewed Ivan Meisner on my podcast, The Introvert's Edge, which talks about confronting the stigma and looking at the introverted strategies that high-level introverted titans, I like to call them, created, allowed them to create their success. So I interviewed him on the podcast. I then asked, asked how I could give him further value. I sent him through a bunch of introductions. I asked him to endorse my book, and he was happy to do so because during the podcast interview, I shared my passion and mission for what I was trying to achieve, and it was something that he believes in. But I will tell you, Ivan says, and so many other people say, 
any marketing is good marketing. So people love having their names on books. People love having the name on now on the back cover and on the front cover, they like it. In the the in the pages, people are getting less and less excited about that because it takes a lot of time to review a book and, and, and write an endorsement. However, with someone like Ivan, it came through a champion, uh, through an, a momentum partner relationship. Now, some of my others, you talked about um, Michael Gerber. Michael Gerber actually was was watching my social profiles. And when he reached out, I actually reached out to him because he liked a couple of the videos that I share online. I put a ton of free videos and you know free content out on LinkedIn. On I mean, I learned on YouTube how to sell. So I try and repay the favor by putting a bunch of free content out there. And here's the person that does his videos actually suggested that he should check out my work because it's like it, it's like one of the market leading ways of putting content and video out there. Now, it's actually not that expensive and I do it all in an automated way because I don't want to be a person taking a photo of my donut for something to say. In truth, the reason why people work so hard on social media is, again, if you can't be the clearest, you have to be the loudest. For me, I focus on strategic messaging so that I don't have to work very hard because my ideal message gets breaks right through the noise. Now, for someone like Michael, he was liking all of my, well, a few of my posts on social media. So I reached out and I told him, which is true, that literally I remember hearing about eMyth around the dinner table as my mother was reading the book and sharing it as she was starting her business and how much of a fan of his work I, uh, I was. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I was. So I started a dialogue with him. You know, I looked at how I could give him value. And by the way, people think that they can't give value to these high level people. High level people, uh, high level people because they're great at one thing. They're not great at everything. So giving him some advice on what I was doing with my videos and how I structured them and some of the, the ways I market, again, not asking for anything in return, eventually fostered a friendship. And now, you know, Ivan and I, uh, Michael Gerber and I, we're great friends. Now, if you look at other people like Neil Patel or Judy Robinette or the, one of the senior professors at Harvard University or at Princeton University, Marshall Goldsmith that have endorsed my book, all these relationships come the same way. But I will give everyone one sneaky secret. If you connect with someone on LinkedIn with a simple message, like I'm a massive fan of your work, and then when they connect with you, send them a message about how much of a fan of your work that, uh, that, that how much of a fan of their work that you are, and then highlight that their work actually inspired you to write your own book, and then talk about the passion and mission behind your own book, and then uh, say that you'd be honored if, if they would consider endorsing your work, and you'd be very open to sending them the book to review, but also a couple of pre-written endorsements that they, of course, can throw out and not use or customize as they see fit, and then ask them for it for and then ask them if this is still their email address. Because on LinkedIn, you can obviously get their email address straight off their profile. You'll find you're actually more likely to get a really positive response. So a lot of people think, oh, it's so hard to get in front of these people. No, they're not. They all have LinkedIn profiles these days. And most people, especially during COVID, they're on LinkedIn all the time. So just reach out again. Don't ask for an endorsement straight away. Share that you're a fan of the work. Then when they connect, share that you're a really big fan, and then Mention that they inspired your work. Tell them that you're going to do the hard hustle for them. I mean, I get people all the time that say, hey, Matt, could you write an endorsement for my book? Like straight out, they reach out to me. I've never spoken to them before. And they ask me for an endorsement. And then when I go back to them and say, well, look, I don't really have time to write a, a full endorsement for you. They're like, oh, okay, no worries. Thanks very much for your time. Well, all I was saying is I don't have time to write one. If they had have written one for me and then I could get someone on my team to review their work to make sure it's consistent with what I do, I would, I would likely endorse their work. But most people are like, oh, here's a load of homework to do. They don't try and make it easier for people. It's actually really easy because most people want to support other people because they had people that supported them when they first started. But if you make it a job for them, if you don't try and make it easy for them, they're not going to want to do it for you. So asking permission and saying, is it okay if I send you a couple of pre-written endorsements that you can customize as you see fit and the manuscript uh, to this email address, all of a sudden they'll say, oh, thank you for asking. Yes, I, I would be happy to do that for you, but it's going to take me some time. Now, often authors leave this to the absolute last minute and now they're like, no, you've got three weeks. That's not gonna work. You need to plan it the right way. Now, sure, you'll be able to get some in three weeks, but I mean, even if you reached out to someone like me, it's going to take me about five, six, seven weeks to get it back to you because, again, we're trying to run an entire business. You reach out to someone like Ivan, someone like Michael Gerber, it's going, I mean, it's going to, like, he, Michael wants it, he, the manuscript sent to his PO box. It's going to take that much time with today's mail service just to get it to him. So, again, it's about pre planning. Now, 
the one thing I will say when it comes to endorsements is don't just ask for endorsements willy-nilly. Find endorsements that are connected to your niche. And the reason why I say this is, I mean, if you look for endorsements of people that aren't related, it doesn't help you in the long term. For me, what I do is I look for my primary audience. I'm the rapid growth guy, and I help introverted service providers obtain rapid growth. Well, where do a lot of introverted service providers hang out? They hang out at B&I groups. So that's why I wanted Ivan Meisner's endorsement. What do a lot of introverted people try and do? Sell online. So they're looking for SEO strategies to try and avoid going out and meeting real people. So who do I get to endorse? Neil Patel, one of the most well-known SEO people on the planet. Then what book are they reading? Well, a lot of them like to read E-Myth to work out how to run their business. That's the number one go-to book for small business owners. So I got Marshall Goldsmith to endorse the book. Then I share those endorsements on social media all the time tagging them on it. Of course, they then share it. They like it. I mean, Marshall Goldsmith has even posted you know, quite a few of my endorsements and images on his own profile, which again drives their audiences to mine. But if it's not your audience, you end up driving a bunch of people that aren't ideal fits to read your book, which actually leads to bad reviews. And that's the last thing you want. So cool. You gave us a full checklist. Hey, people, go back, write it down. This is your checklist for the next three weeks if you are writing a book like I am. And I will definitely implement every single step. Thank you. And I will report back. So cool. What are typical mistakes that you see introverts do in sales? Well, that's simple. I mean, it's the same mistake in sales and in networking, right? I mean, they try to become more extroverted. I mean, that's a, a surefire way to fail. I mean, the, the fact is that when we try and behave extroverted, firstly, it comes across as inauthentic. It draws our energy a lot more. But also us trying to wing it, and this is the importance of having a system, is when we try and wing things, and it, well, when an extrovert wings things, and it doesn't work out. It's like water off a duck's back. They're straight to the next conversation. They don't really care. An introvert internalizes everything. We feel everything. And because of that, when somebody rejects us, we feel it's a rejection on us and it really hurts. So because of that, following the extroverted mechanisms of networking and sales just doesn't work. What I like to think about is sales and networking as a system. And it's a system like anything else. Now, Henry Ford, you know, is well known for creating the mass production line for motor vehicles. You know, when he created his first production line, if something went wrong, I'm sure he didn't go, oh my gosh, I was never supposed to build cars. He just said, you know what, there's, there's a problem in the, in the system. Let's focus on tinkering with that and making it better. Right in the book, I give an example of how little, I think he had like a million orders in the first month. And he had like less than a few thousand cars that came off the production line. Like that would never have worked out. But he didn't go, oh my gosh, what have I done here? He just kept tinkering with the different elements with inside his production line to perfect it. Now, the other thing that he did really well is, he, I mean, he's famous for this quip saying, you can have any color car you want as long as it's black. Why did he say that? Because he said, until I perfect the production line, I'm not going to worry about all the bells and whistles. Right. So again, with introverts, I always suggest get the production line right. Get the sales process structured before you worry about all the, the, the little bell, bells and whistle elements about, you know, being super great at, at what you do. The same with networking. Build that system out. Now, don't follow an extroverted method because it's just not going to work for you. I mean, the average networker, trainer, sales trainer that's an extrovert says, oh, it's easy. You just do this. Well, it's not easy for us. And we don't like bulldog techniques. We don't like hard closing. So you need to follow an introvert's method. Now, remember, I'm not telling you I'm the only introverted person sharing this stuff. While I may have the only book in the world on introverted selling methods, Jeb Blunt, Zig Ziglar, Paul Smith, all of these people are introverted, right? You just admitted to being introverted. So many people that we think are ext extroverted, gregarious people are introverted. Follow one method though. Sales, networking, it's not like mixed martial arts. Pick one system. And work with that. You throw in multiple systems, it's just going to be complicated. It's going to go horribly wrong. Then once you've got the system and you feel like you've got the flow right, then focus on doubling down on each one of those elements. I mean, I, I mentioned my backstory just slightly, but I'll, I'll, I'll elucidate on it a little bit more. When I mean, when I was in late high school, as I said, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader. I was horribly introverted. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I got diagnosed with Erlen syndrome when I was 16. And that basically means I can put on a pair of glasses and miraculously I can learn to read. Not like everyone else, but I could start the process of learning to read. Now, what actually happened is I, I, I hustled to get into you know the top grades at school. I got in the top 20% of my state, but I was exhausted. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life. My family and I all agreed I was going to spend a year finding myself, not sitting on the couch watching Oprah or traveling Europe. 
Like my dad broke his back 80 hours a week. There's no way he would have accepted that. But we agreed that I was going to get a job. So I took a job at a back in a back office doing data entry at a real estate agent. I definitely was not the one out selling. Three weeks in, my boss pulls me aside and he says, Matt, they're closing down this office. You're out of a job. I'm so sorry. I'm like, what, what am I going to do now? Hustling to find a job at Christmas time in when it's summer, everyone goes on holidays on the 20th of December. They don't come back till the 15th or 20th in January. The only jobs I could get were commission only sales roles. After five days product training, I get thrown on this road, Sydney Road, Melbourne, Australia, and get told to go and sell. I didn't even know what to say. So I took a deep breath and I walked in the first door and I was luckily enough, politely told to leave. Then I was less like, like politely told to leave. Then I was sworn at. Then I was told to get a real job. I mean, that was always my personal favorite, right? That was the only job I could get. Door after door, this happened until I got to my 93rd door where I made my first sale. And I remember I was ecstatic for like 45 seconds until I had my second realization for the day. I'm going to do this again tomorrow and the next day and the next. And I think this is what happens with a lot of introverts. Well, a lot of extroverts as well, right? We just believe that we only have two options. Hustle through it. Let's grind it out. And that's why you see so many entrepreneurs and, and, and business owners and you know people that even work for organizations. We're just going to grind it out. We're going to hustle. Well, that's fine. But I mean, that's hard work. And it's fine to grind it out. I mean, you need to have work ethic. But work ethic without a great strategy is kind of pointless. Well, at least it's going to mean a really hard life. And I wasn't willing to accept that. But I also wasn't willing to run away. I wasn't willing to quit, which is what 18 of my training group of 20 people did. So what I decided is there had to be another path. And I think this is important because most people go, am I going to grind it out and rely on lady luck or am I just going to quit? I always, mainly because the world's never worked for me, like I couldn't read until I discovered a pair of glasses. And until then, everyone said I was a dyslexic that didn't apply it myself. So I always knew there had to be another path. So I went, what if sales is a system like anything else? And then I went, well, I can't exactly pick up a Brian Tracy or a Zig Ziglar book because at the end of the day, it would have taken me a year to read it, let alone apply it. But I discovered YouTube and I typed in sales system. And all these videos came out. And then every day I would go out in the field and I'd practice what I learned the night before for eight hours. Then I'd go home and I'd practice the next step in the sales process for another eight hours. Day after day, I did this. Every day, weekends, I'd spend 16 hours practicing. Now, I'm sure this doesn't sound fun to anyone that's listening, but every day I'd get better. Soon it was 78 doors, then it was 45 doors, and then 36 doors, and then 21 doors, then 18 doors, then nine. I got it down eventually to making the sale on average every three doors. Now, about six weeks in, my manager pulls me into the office. I thought I was in trouble. I mean, he had this puzzled look on his face. And I mean, remember, I was the quiet guy. So I'd hand my paperwork in downstairs. I wouldn't talk to anyone upstairs. I mean, all these salespeople, boisterous salespeople talking about how hard the market is now and how they convince that customer to buy. I'd say nothing. My manager pulls me in and he says, Matt, we're kind of blown away by this, but we just got our national sales figures. And it just so happens you came up as the number one salesperson in the company. I mean, this was the largest sales and marketing company in the Southern Hemisphere. I went from scared to selling, terrified to being the number one person in the organization, thousands of salespeople within the space of just six weeks. So if for those people that think that sales isn't a systemizable process, for those people that believe that they can't do it, I mean, I had no business being in sales. I mean, if you saw photos back then of my braces, bad acne, you know, my eye wouldn't keep eye contact yet. With a sales system, I could practice it, which stopped me being so stuck in my head and allowed me to feel like to the other person, it felt like an organic conversation. To me, it felt like Groundhog Day because I was practicing it so much. So I've been able to do that with sales. I've been able to do that with networking. And now, I mean, I do it with public speaking. I get in stages in front of thousands of people and I just deliver a scripted process, which is customized for every audience, of course. But I mean, I'm listed as one of the top 50 speakers in the world. There is no way that an introvert that is terrified of speaking in front of people should be one of the top 50 speakers in the world. But I got there by creating a systematic process. Now, for those people that believe that scripting is a bad thing, remember those authentic people that sound amazing in all your favorite movies. People like Leonardo DiCaprio, an introvert, by the way. Bill Murray, another introvert, by the way are using scripts. The difference is they're not reading it like a robot telemarketer that is just reading it straight off the paper. They've embodied the part, they've embraced the character, and now they're delivering it authentically. But they're pretending to be someone else. You just have to learn how to portray the best version of yourself. This is so powerful. Again, you gave away a lot of, a lot of tools, a lot of tactics. This is amazing. So where can people grab your book and which one should they buy first? 
<laughs> well, it really depends. I mean, if you've got lots of people, you know, I had a, a client, Derek Lewis, the guy that worked with me on the book, and he had leads coming in because he was pretty good at Google AdWords, but he couldn't close them. So if you're in a situation where you're getting lots of leads and lots of people come through and you can't close them, I'd suggest you start with the first book on sales. And you can, as I said, you can download the first chapter of that at theintrovertsedge.com. Now, if you're in that situation where you don't have any leads or you don't even really, you, you find that you're in that battle of struggling to set yourself apart and no one really gets it and they're all commoditizing you and fighting you on price and you just don't get enough leads, period, then I think you should start with the Introvert's Edge to networking, which again, you can download the first chapter at theintrovertsedge.com forward slash networking. Now, each one of the books is available in Kindle, in, in you know physical copy and in audio book, which does amazingly well. And every one of the books comes with an implementation training in the bonuses, which so once you've read the book, it shows you in the video training and it comes free with the book, how to actually apply it in your day to day lives. So cool. Everybody go get the book, the introverts edge.com, get your free first chapter, enjoy it. Matthew Polar, everybody, thank you for being here and please come back soon. Avoid trying to do thousands of things that doesn't work. We have 274 templates for your business success. Reach your ambitious goals with one-on-one -on -one sprint coach. We double your revenue in 90 days.